that hallowed peace of earth, that land of light and revelation, is the home to the memories and dreams of Jews, Muslims, and Christians throughout the world. As we all know, devotion to that land has also been the source of conflict and bloodshed for too long. Throughout this century, bitterness between the Palestinian and Jewish people has robbed the entire region of its resources, its potential, and too many of its sons and daughters. During the next week, uh, 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 various uh, uh, positions uh, of both sides will be assessed and uh, re-examined. And uh, I uh, can assure you that uh, there is no crisis and both sides are very much committed to the peace process. And I believe that next week the, the results and the, the, the outcome of the meeting will be, uh, will be uh, positive. Don't worry about it. There is no a real danger to the peace process you can you can be you can be very much relieved okay on the day of the assassination rabin was not well protected he went to a massive rally in the center of tel aviv there were thousands of people swarming around him the important one was a 25-year-old right-wing extremist named Yigal Amir, who had studied Jewish texts for inspiration before deciding to assassinate Yitzhak Rabin at this peace rally, where Rabin had urged, sing only a song of peace. Nobody asked him any questions, and when somebody did ask a question, he just said, I am one of the drivers. The assassin uh, approached him from the back, and actually shot him from zero distance, point blank, uh, three bullets to, to the back. It was in the news say that you, uh, you've been in Tel Aviv giving condolences to Mrs. Uh, Rabin. Definitely. It was uh, our duty because, uh, you know, in the unique the funeral, I haven't the ability to participate for security matters. Then uh, it had been arranged to go uh, for a few of us, me and Abu Mazen and Abada, to go to offer our condolences to Her Excellency. What did you say to him? That uh, we lost a brave man uh, who made the peace of the braves with us. He was our partner. And uh, we thank uh, you for continuing this road and his march. A newly revealed videotape shows Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu once openly discussed his intent to attack the Palestinian government, undermine the Oslo peace accords, and manipulate the United States to ensure its backing. The 2001 recording shows Netanyahu meeting with Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank. Netanyahu was then out of government after serving his first stint in office. Apparently unaware he's being recorded, Netanyahu talks openly of, quote, a broad attack on the Palestinian government, saying, quote, the main thing, first of all, is to hit them, not just one blow, but blows that are so painful that the price will be too heavy to be borne. Netanyahu also outlines how we would undermine the 1993 Oslo Accords, he says, which established the basis for Israeli-Palestinian peace talks by declaring any West Bank land that Israel wants to retain as, quote, military and security zones. Addressing potential U.S. opposition to Israeli expansionism, Netanyahu says, quote, I know what America is. America is a thing you can move very easily, move it in the right direction. They won't get in the way. President Bush uh, said correctly that uh, uh, you have to root out not only the uh, terrorist organizations, but also the regimes that harbor them and give them safe haven. Uh, as a point of fact, uh, Arafat's part of this terrorist empire is one of the big uh, factories of suicide bombers. I mean, he's got kindergarten camps, summer camps, uh, that teach uh, little Palestinian children to become suicide bombers. So he's preparing not only the 
suicide killers of today, but the suicide pilots of tomorrow. Yasser Arafat is more modest in his goals as part of this family. He wants to merely destroy Israel. But we have to get the entire terror network when there is still time. And nothing that you will do with Arafat, making, giving him the hills above Tel Aviv is not going to make him stop. We are completely shocked, completely shocked, unbelievable. Right, that's the view from the Palestinian side. Joining me now here in the BBC World Studio is the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, uh, who's in London at the moment. Mr. Barak, welcome to BBC World. First, your reaction, having heard what's happened. At least four planes have been hijacked, and uh, there may be more. The world will not be the same from today on. It's an attack uh, against our whole civilization. Your words, Mr. Barak, are very similar to the words used to justify missile defense in the United States, which may have taken another 10 or 15 years. Here we've seen low-tech hijacked by those with evil intent. Yeah, I believe that it's, uh, first of all, uh, missile defense is also something which is clearly needed as long as there are like this, ro does it? rogue states and it should be done and it should be deployed maybe not on national level but only on trans-regional uh, level to cover exactly the threat from rogue states like Iran, Iraq or, or Libya. I believe that the uh, world intelligence community in a concerted effort can identify within a few months the sources of this terror. They can identify the places where they are deployed on earth. Every such a place is within certain country. The uh, uh, Bin Laden sits in Afghanistan. There is a source well, of terror. Who else terror. Can you identify, though? Uh, because we're not saying he's responsible for this necessarily. No, no, we, we don't say that he's responsible, uh, necessarily responsible. Osama bin Laden, number one on everybody's most wanted list in the world today, is saying that, once again, that he did not do it. Don't hold him responsible. He's not guilty. He, of course, is the man that um, has been fingered by just about everybody in the world. And now he's released a statement um, really underlining that he he had nothing to do with it. So let's go through the statement. There's some interesting aspects to this. He said, after the recent attacks which the U.S. has witnessed, the U.S. government ventured to point fingers at me, accuse me of involvement. The U.S. government has consistently blamed me for being behind every occasion its enemies attack it, that is the United States. And it goes on. I would like to assure the world that I did not plan the recent attacks, which seems to have been planned by people for personal reasons. And as for me, I have been living in the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and following its leader's rules. The current leader does not allow me to exercise such operations. Uh, so, but that is an issue I think that we can, we can handle. The main point that I want to stress is that we don't approach this as, um, as a small problem of uh, uh, Israel or a small problem of America vis-a-vis -vis bin Laden, because what we have here is something far worse. You know, in 1995, I wrote a book called Fighting Terrorism, and I said that if we don't arrest the tide of Islamic um, militant terrorism, we, militant Islamic terrorism, then the next thing that will be is not a, a, a car bomb uh, in the uh, World Trade Center, uh, but uh, a nuclear bomb. In December of last year, uh, Fox did a four-part series. I reported a four-part series that uh, described several scenarios, several dynamics. Uh, within, the U within the continental United States. It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S who may have known things they didn't tell us before September 11th. Fox News correspondent Carl Cameron has details in the first of a four-part series. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. 
There is no indication that the Israelis were involved in the 9-11 attacks, but investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins, but when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, Evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Fox News has learned that one group of Israelis, spotted in North Carolina recently, is suspected of keeping an apartment in California to spy on a group of Arabs who the United States is also investigating for links to terrorism. Numerous classified documents obtained by Fox News indicate that even prior to September 11th, as many as 140 other Israelis had been detained or arrested in a secretive and sprawling investigation into suspected espionage by Israelis in the United States. Investigators from numerous government agencies are part of a working group that's been compiling evidence since the mid-90s. These documents detail hundreds of incidents in cities and towns across the country that investigators say, quote, may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. The first part of the investigation focuses on Israelis who say they are art students from the University of Jerusalem and Bazalel Academy. They repeatedly made contact with U.S. government personnel, the report says, by saying they wanted to sell cheap art or handiwork. Documents say they, quote, targeted and penetrated military bases, the DEA, FBI, and dozens of other government facilities, and even secret offices and unlisted private homes of law enforcement and intelligence personnel. The majority of those questioned, quote, stated they served in military intelligence, electronic surveillance intercept, and or explosive ordnance units. Uh, there is a report that was circulated and has now been disclosed by the DEA that reported that over the course of a year and a half, numerous federal agencies had encountered uh, individuals who referred to themselves as Israeli art students, uh, essentially visiting these facilities, military installations, FBI, DEA, INS, both the publicly listed addresses as well as some that are not made public and those particular facilities are intended to be kept uh, secret. And they began to ask questions and attempt to sell their art. And we reported that this was a dynamic that had been described by government documents as an intelligence gathering operation. And what you're looking at right now is a book produced by an art group called Gelatin. And the book is called The Bee Thing. And these individuals, this art group, was actually living in World Trade Center Tower 1 um, shortly before 9-11, in the months leading up to 9-11, in the year prior to 9-11. Okay, so here we go. We've got a few pictures. Um, here's thousands of electronic fuse holders used to blow up buildings shown in these pictures from the World Trade Center. These art students have been tied to Mossad explosive experts and took over and lived on the 91st floor. They were given construction passes to have full access to the building. Project we did in New York, it's 10 years ago. Because um, New York is a good place to do shows. It's like to have a studio in there, it was on the 91st floor and we shared with about 20 other artists because it's basically impossible to, it's very difficult to bring material inside because it's so high up, there's no telephones, nobody can come and visit you and it was very strange. We decided we will open a window and build a balcony. There's also, they also have some dimensions drawn out here. I believe this is kind of to prepare for their balcony. At least that's what I'm assuming. Some of this stuff, I really don't know what to make of it. Some of it's written in German. Because again, this gelatin group was actually based in Austria. In Vienna, Austria. Here's another sketch. Um, very, very weird. Down here, it's, uh, it looks like it says fields, flowers, flunder, thicken, I believe is what it says. And then it took us about three weeks to open the window because it's a very complicated operation. It was, in the end, it figured out, it turned out that it is like a car windshield, like the windshield of a car. It's a rubber, a black rubber band. And what you do is you take a silicone spray and spray it in this black rubber. And then it, it makes the rubber smooth and go and you take, you can like grab in and pull this rubber out. 
and then we had we had bought this vacuum suction caps to hold the glass and like and lift it out of the frame. And then what we built, we went into a into a place where we we got cardboard boxes for free. They were folded up. Here is another picture. As you can see, there's uh, boxes with BB-18. And there is a lot of boxes. I mean, there's the one right side. And now we've got the left side. And uh, here is the picture. As you see, one of the windows has been taken out. And there's also been wooden um, balcony almost put in. So they can walk out all. Gelatin space, the window where action will happen, is walled in with a system of cardboard boxes, and you saw that in some of the photos. And then it says, other artists sharing Floor 91 do not know what we are planning and doing. The construction of the balcony and all other preparations are not visible for them. And then it says, 1.2, the balcony. The balcony is a prefabricated construction made by gelatin. One person at a time will be able to stand on it. The balcony will be camouflaged. It will be built to be as to be as less visible as possible for any passerby on the street. It will be taken apart the moment after being pulled back in. 3.1 the window. One window will be taken out. The removing of the window is done in a professional and secured action. No constructive parts of the building will be removed or damaged. There will not be any visible traces after the window will have been put back in. And then it talks about here up on the next page 1.4 documentation. Photographs and video coverage will be will only be taken by contracted professionals. Film rolls and videotapes will be handed to Gelatin. There will be no journalists nor press photographers. There is no intention to get the story in the media. There will be no pictures being published but by Gelatin. Eyewitnesses reported seeing a group of young men apparently celebrating. I grab my binoculars and I'm trying, you know, to look the Twin Towers, but what caught my attention down there, I see this van park, and I see three guys on top of the van. They seem to be taking a movie, and I could see that they were like happy, you know, they're laughing. A major terrorist manhunt began, and just six hours after the attack, the van was stopped at a roadblock by patrolman Scott DiCarlo. Over two months of interrogation began. The FBI discovered the men weren't from Al-Qaeda. They were Israelis. An enduring conspiracy theory began that they were Israeli field agents who'd uncovered the 9-11 plot in advance. Israel had deliberately failed to warn the US authorities because it wanted to ensure that American public opinion was hostile to the Arab world. Now, it wasn't a nuclear bomb. It was a 350-ton conventional bomb. But I'm sure you don't doubt, and nobody who listens to us now doubts, that if uh, these uh, maniacal movements and the regimes that support them develop nuclear weapons, they will use them. And then you're talking about not the horrendous casualties. And by the way, it's, it's, it breaks the heart just to listen to the stories that you gave earlier. Now Channel 4 traveled to Israel and spoke to three of the five men arrested that day to hear their side of the story. One of the neighbors give a call to the feds and tell there is a white van with five uh, Arab people. As you see, I'm blonde, blue, blue eyes. And he tell there is a bomb in a white van, he gave the number, five Arab people and they're on the way to Manhattan to make a suicide. I was the driver, the policeman took his gun and put it in my head. Where are the bombs? Where did you want to do the um, 
suicide and I don't know nothing about what to say. What I told them, that I'm just a tourist from Israel, I'm Jewish. And he told me, don't talk, if you talk I'm gonna shoot you. People were spitting on us from the street, they were passing with the cars and spit on us. Because they thought that we are the Arabs, they were looking for someone to blame. A passerby took these photos of the police searching the van. Five men were inside it. Some had dual nationalities and were carrying more than one passport. Others had flight tickets to leave the U.S. within days. Fearing robbery, one had over $4,000 hidden in a sock. They were ripping things, they took the camera, they uh, were screaming at us all the, all the time. Put your head uh, into the ground or we were going to shoot you. They told interrogators they were working for Urban Moving, a shipping and storage firm run by an Israeli businessman who often employed Israeli students without work permits. The men say there was an innocent explanation for what was found in the van and their behavior on 9-11. They were, they say, simply on a working holiday. We heard in the news that one of the planes was uh, crashing down the building and we thought it was an accident at the beginning. So we went up to the roof of the moving and we saw the building burning. There is a better view from a building in Jersey that is up a hill, straight line to the World Trade Center. We decided to go up there. It's like two, three minutes from the office. Stand over there and take some pictures. Everyone wants pictures like this in his camera. Their boss at Urban Moving, Dominic Suter, was questioned by the FBI, but then disappeared back to Israel. It left lots of unanswered questions and fueled suspicion about the five men. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Would you please welcome the former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. How are you today, Mr. Prime Minister? I'm fine. I, I is see... that what I should refer to you as? Because I know you've had many jobs in the Israeli government, foreign minister and prime minister and uh, finance minister, UN ambassador. Now, Bill, you, you want to start with a quarrel? You want to call me prime minister? I'm not going to argue with you. No, I, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I know when Israeli politicians come to the United States, it usually means they're trying to get their old job back. No, actually, it doesn't, because, um, uh, because America is uh, of interest to us, whether in opposition or in government. America is important for everyone. But you do uh, want your old job back. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, that's the kind of honesty we don't have here in America <laughs> from our politicians. Um, and I have heard you referred to many times as the most Americanized of the Israeli prime ministers. Do you find that to be a compliment? If uh, by that it, it means that you talk straight to your uh, audience, um, I'll tell you what, I spent a few, uh, yes I would, but uh, in, it's supposed to be derogatory uh, because, uh, uh, because the idea of communicating with voters was uh, uh, an abstruse and alien idea in, in the party system that we had, which was more or less Tammany Hall. That was an American idea too that went by the wayside for a new American politics and I prefer the new one with all its failings to the old one with all its corruptions. <laughs> well, I don't know if we've gotten rid of all our corruption. No, you haven't. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, unlike America, uh, Israel seems to be able to fight wars very quickly. What is your secret? Because we don't seem to have the hang of that. The secret is that we have America. <laughs> 